Well, good morning and or good afternoon. As I say every time on these uh, live webcast series, we have timed this for a noon Eastern, but we appreciate that we have audience members joining us uh, from various different time zones and quite frankly, different continents too. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening. My name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte and have had a pleasure of hosting these live webcast series that we have been delivering for the last, well, more than two years now. Um, I would like to remind the audience that uh, this is a live broadcast and the intent of us doing this live is to provide you with the opportunity to engage with our guests. So um, please, using the Q&A function of this Zoom platform, please feel free to submit your questions. And we are going to do our utmost to get through as many questions as we can. Um, this particular session on this fine February 22nd um, is going to be a deep dive into our Third, Tech Trend 2023. And uh, I'm really delighted and excited to introduce you all to our panel, our real distinguished panel that is going to help us with the deep dive. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled to welcome David Linthicum. David is a globally renowned and respected thought leader on all matters cloud, cloud technology. Uh, and David was instrumental in capturing, defining, and documenting this particular trend uh, on taming the multi-cloud chaos. Joining David uh, today is my partner, Kevin Young. Um, Kevin is a Canadian leader of Deloitte's cloud transformation practice. Uh, and Kevin, you're going to be providing us with a bit of a Canadian context to this conversation. So thank you very much for joining us. And of course, Mike Bechtel, who I keep saying has the coolest title <laughs> amongst all 415,000 Deloitte people around the world. Mike Bechtel, our chief futurist. And um, so how we're going to conduct this session is we're gonna start <laughs> by allowing us, allowing Mike to provide us with a bit of a context around our tech trends what they are, how we are thinking of those tech trends. And after that preamble, we are then going to invite David, Kevin, Mike, and I to have the conversation and that, deep, that deeper dive. So with that, Mike, over to you. Over to me. Well, Dalibor, uh, thank you always for your partnership and um, hail fellow well-met good cheer and optimism. I couldn't ask for a better a better uh, partner in this series and in this work. And um, uh, your, your penchant for self-deprecation should not get in the way of the celebration of everything you do to help us stay hip to what's new and next in tech yourself. So thank you, sir. Um, folks, for those of you who, <clears throat> who are joining us for the first time or for the nth time, uh, welcome. And pardon my lack of uh, eye contact. I'm just making sure all the, all the uh, AV is set up. So again, as Dollarbor said, I'm Mike. I serve as our chief futurist and have the privilege of ringleading our global Deloitte tech trends research each year. And uh, tech trends, and each, each time we, we hit this, it's important that we, we lay out the table stakes for those who are joining fresh, but we never want to cause eye rolls or, um, you know, <laughs> lapses among people who've, who've sat through three of these already. And so what I would tell you is, uh, we've been at this for 15 years, and that's not a pat on the back, right? Nor is that a um, trust us, we're professionals sort of, a, of an assertion. Rather, it's the, it's the recognition that when you've been studying the, the new, the zeitgeist, the, the trends, the fads, the, the buzzwords, for as long as we have, you start to see patterns within the patterns. And the recognition that we've come up with over the last 15 years is that for the last 15 years and, and per some follow-on research, for the last 150, the whole history of information technology 
specifically information technology innovation, has been a series of evolutions, not revolutions, along these three tracks. And that's not to say, you know, other stuff doesn't matter too. You know, you, there's plenty of important waypoints in enterprise IT history that aren't depicted here. Like, what about networking? Yeah, good point. It ties it all together, right? What about this? What about that? Sure, sure, sure. But at its base, simpler user interfaces, smarter information and insight systems, and more capable, more abundant processing and computation platforms have really marked the step changes in IT over the last couple of generations. Now, we use this, right? We use this framework as a means to say, hey, if we have a sense of where we've been and where we are, we can use that tool to meaningfully project where we're headed. And so Deloitte Tech Trends, right, recognizes that, again, simpler interactions, smarter information management, and more capable computation are likely to be the key to what separates profitable from merely possible over the next N years, where, you know, N isn't two, N is, you know, hopefully with any, with, with any, with any probability, you know, 20, 200. Now, right? A startup uh, with move fast and break things energy. That's all we need to worry about, right? We'd say, hey, those are the three ingredients I need to bake my cake. But here's the rub. Deloitte serves household name organizations that some of you are a part of, right? And all of you have heard of. And established incumbent success stories can't merely move fast and break things. They can't merely navigate to what's next. You have to nurture what's now. You have to protect what you have. As, as we say, you need to steward today while you look to pioneer towards tomorrow. And so we also chronicle trends around the business, organizational, finance, people side of technology, right? Around the trust, risk, what could go wrong side of enterprise IT. And then on the bottom right, right? Those rusty but trusty systems that, you know, whether you, you wish you had them or, or you, you, you don't, um, you do, right? And so getting old to play nicely with new, right? This is the adulting that needs to happen if we're going to meaningfully pioneer into that blue sky stuff on the top. Now, again, Deloitte Tech Trends for 15 years has chronicled stories that have coalesced into these six buckets and we now use those buckets as a means to go fishing for the stories that matter most to our clients. Well, today's deep dive, our third of six, is a focus on what's new in computation, right? What's, what's on the top of mind for those folks who've been on, frankly, a 10-year journey up and into the cloud? Well, for, for those pioneers among you, 15-year journey, heck, 20 for, for the earliest of early. Well, here's the story. I'm going to give us a brief flyby of this trend. And then we're going to open it up to the good part, which is the discussion uh, with, our, with our two guest experts today. But the high-level idea is this, and I like to explain it. I like to explain this idea of above the clouds, taming multi-cloud chaos. I like to open this with an analogy. And here's the analogy. About eh, maybe eight years ago, my family and I made the then bold, but ultimately no brainer decision to quote unquote, cut the cord on our cable television, right? Because we had a $250 a month bill. And there was this thing called Netflix that for $9.99 a month, could give us all sorts of great stuff. Now, make, make no mistake, it was scary, right? There was this feeling like change is scary, right? It's different. I, we're definitely going to miss out on some stuff, but 90% eh, savings, let's do it. And so we did it and we never looked back. Then a couple of years later, we saw there's this other thing out there. It's called Hulu. And for only another $10 more a month, we can have twice the shows, twice the movies, twice the stuff. What's not to like? And we're still saving 80% relative to the old cable bill. Great. 
And then there's Disney Plus and Vudu, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Peacock, Paramount Plus. You know how this movie goes, right? In our case, we ended up with most of them. And I did the math a couple months back. We're still saving, I think, something like $20 a month relative to the old bill. But there's a new problem. And here's the problem. Complexity. It's a hairball. The best example I can give you is last Easter, my father-in-law, my 16-year-old son are sitting on either side of me in our family room. And my father-in-law, he's 83. He says, turn on the Chicago White Sox. And my son, before I could get a word in edgewise, he says, dad, or papa, dad's a technology futurist. And so TV can't be easy here. And the shame, the guilt, the horror of being uh, lambasted by two, two generations at once, right? The speed with which I whipped out a credit card to try to find something, some, some control plane, some, some offering that would offer simplicity as a service, quick navigability, discoverability to find the Chicago White Sox game, right? I set a land speed record. Okay, why is this guy talking to us about cable TV and a uh, mid-market baseball team? Because that whole story is a nearly perfect analog for what our clients are finding with enterprise cloud, right? Think back to your own organization, wherever you are in the journey, step one, hey, somebody's offering to allow us to lift and shift our infrastructure for pennies on the dollar. Seems scary, but kind of a no-brainer. Let's try it. And so you did. And then you found out that there were some other folks who offered some best of breed service that could zhuzh up your cloud experience even more. So you grab that one too. Then you grab another one, you grab another one. Before you know it, it's the cable TV problem, but for enterprise IT, right? Or for this AI generated picture that I found in a magazine article that my partner Dave here was quoted in just this morning. Um, it, it's a same hot mess, right? The same hairball but as regards enterprise IT, not streaming television. And so what we're starting to see emerge as a solve, right? And what today's discussion is going to be about is the slow but steady emergence of simplicity as a service of third-party players, Big Panda, Dynatrace, VMware, Red Hat, others and others and others. And we'll, we'll talk about a bunch, right? But, and these are examples, right? This isn't recommendation. This is for example, for example, for example. But players who are coming in and saying, hey, listen, we can begin to provide an observability layer, a control layer, a discoverability layer above that mess, above the clouds. And likely it's going to be from these third party players because why the hyperscalers? right? GCP, AWS, Azure, right? They understandably, right? They're understandably inclined to keep you in their amazing, high-performing, beautiful gardens, right? And so they'll provide minimum viable connectivity into each other. But we've seen this movie before, right? We've seen this story before where it typically takes somebody other than the people who are engendering the walled garden complexities to come in and simplify and rectify those complexities. This is a picture from 1911 when uh, telegraph companies, the original multi-cloud chaos, you know, had separate lines for every house and every business because there wasn't yet, you know, a middleware, a vitria, a simplicity as a service. And so with that gang, we're gonna move beyond my scene setting and into kind of the meat and potatoes here and uh, in doing so, let me turn that off and get back to big faces. Dave, Kevin, Dalibor, take it away. H how are you starting to see this manifest in the big world out there and, and with your clients? Dave, over to you. I think you're, you're okay. probably- <laughs> I yeah. thought it was with the group. <clears throat> People are hitting the complexity wall. Uh, Mike, by the way, did an excellent job of explaining the concept and why we're looking at this today. 
And also looking at the pragmatic aspect of it. If you think about it, we're, we're reusing an old architecture trick that's been around for a long time. So I'm a distributed computing architect by trade. I've uh, been doing that for a long period of time and obviously transfer that into cloud computing and kind of realize early on that we're running into a complexity issue. In other words, we're, as people are moving into multi-cloud and, uh, and, and building these systems on what they were leveraging for best of breed technology, they had organic growth that was leading to a complexity that couldn't be operationalized. In other words, they, they couldn't operate it uh, as cheaply and as efficiently as they needed. And that's what's occurring right now. We're seeing this with our client base and the research that we're doing with the Center for Integrated Research and some of those surveys are coming out now is a proof point to what Mike just said. The fact is, is that we're growing the value of this technology as quickly as we can, namely cloud computing. We're able to onboard these resources at the speed of need. And in doing so, we're going after the best of breed technology that we view as gonna be more effective and efficient for the solutions that we're building. And we're getting to a level of complexity. We're moving from say 500 services under management, maybe five years ago, to 6,000 services under management. And by the way, we're not increasing the people who operate the system. We're not increasing the architects. We're not increasing the developers. We're just adding all these things on that you have to operate and play with. Very similar to the analogy Mike used, which is spot on, uh, the ability to kind of aggregate all the streaming services we're dealing with today. And that's why we have Apple TV and Roku and all these things to manage the complexity for us on our behalf. Basically the same concept. So as people onboarded these systems, as people, leverage this technology to the benefit of the business. Um, we're seeing this complexity wall being hit and there's a few problems with this. Number one, it increases security risk because we have to manage systems that are very heterogeneous and deal with different security uh, patterns, things like that. It decreases agility. In other words, we can't move and change the systems as quickly as we think because of the complexity that we have to go through. And the worst of it all, it removes the value of cloud computing entirely. In fact, we're seeing, if it, we, we had a, a cloud complexity management report that we put out uh, three or four years ago and looking and studying for the report, people are hitting negative value very quickly within cloud computing. And we saw last year in some of the surveys that are out there, they're not getting the ROI that they thought we were, they were promised from cloud computing. And you look at why they're not getting the ROI, it's because, because of the additional dollars that need to be spent in managing this, this complexity and tactical levels. Now, complexity, you can manage complexity a couple of ways. In other words, you can manage complexity on complexity's terms. In other words, dealing with the particular platforms on the platform's levels. In other words, dealing with a single security system and a single management system within a public cloud provider number one, same for public cloud provider number two, whatever native security and management and governance they have, and all the, and basically down the line, three or four clouds typically in a multi-cloud deployment. In doing that, you're basically pushing complexity as your problem. In other words, we're understanding that we have to deal with heterogeneity, we have to deal with complexity of services, we have to deal with lots of things that we didn't have to deal with five years ago. And people just accept that that's the way it has to be done. So they went ahead and hired the skills that they needed, you know, for, you know, say AWS, and Microsoft and Google or whatever cloud providers they had now, the industry cloud and SaaS based systems and all the things that kind of make up this very complex stack, end up having huge amounts of money and spending that goes on and really kind of understood that that's the way it has to be if they have to manage these complex environments. A couple of things, they had a couple of reactions to this. Number one, it's getting too complex and too expensive. Therefore, we're gonna limit you to one particular cloud provider. Uh, not a good thing because we're limiting the choices of the people in the organization who are innovative that actually build the solutions to take things to the next level. So you don't wanna do that because they basically define the value of the business moving forward. They create the innovative supply chains and the. AI based systems and they use the technologies in certain ways. And we want to provide them with access to whatever they need to make that happen. And so that went out. The other thing to do is start reducing the redundancy through an architectural pattern uh, in terms of collecting it and aggregating it through automation and aggregation, where instead of dealing with five different security layers and five different operations layers and five different native, uh, native app dev layers, all these sorts of things that we dealt with traditionally within the system on the terms of the particular cloud provider, we put this layer of technology above all these various systems, which carry the same thing out, but do so in a common way that cross and spans cloud. So we have one security system, identity access management, maybe two, 
but we have something in the stack where we're not trying to solve the problem within each cloud provider. We're doing so in a central layer. And we're abstracting the lower level technical details behind that. Um, we're doing the same thing with management and monitoring. We're doing the same thing with application development. We're doing the same thing with hosting services, monitoring, management, all these sorts of things that we try had to solve at the tactical level within the cloud, but pushing it up at a higher level. And that does a couple of things. Number one, we're human beings are only dealing with this one layer of abstraction. So in other words, we're dealing with a single security layer, or maybe two. We're dealing with single governance layer, management monitoring layer, things like that. So we're not having to keep the skills around for the tactical capabilities of each and every cloud. So that saves us money. The yeah. fewer complexity, fewer moving parts means that it's going to be more secure. Um, the ability to manage things like performance in a centralized layer means that it's gonna be better performing. The ability to do with FinOps accounting and other governance systems at a single layer. So we're not dealing with each cloud on the tactical terms that the cloud is dictating. We're dealing with our terms, which exist at this higher level service to make this thing uh, something that's gonna remove the redundancy and stop being stop digging a hole. You know, if we're in a hole, stop digging. And the ability yeah. to come up with this macro architecture, but things can be plugged in and unplug, whether it's a legacy system, an edge-based system, cloud-based systems, and they can deal with the same layers of technology that we deal with as we span the technology layer. So that's the idea between the super cloud and meta cloud, and I'm not getting involved in the buzzwords of it. At, this is just an architectural efficiency to make utilization of this technology, which is dealing with very complex systems. We're dealing with more heter heterogeneity. We're dealing with many more services, right. but do so in a simple way that we reduce cost, reduce risk, uh, uh, make security risk go down. Lots of good things will happen if you start getting into the fact we're gonna push these things to another logical layer that exists above the clouds and also above the legacy systems and edge-based systems. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I, like, I like this streaming analogy because um, it, it really is, you know, if you think about the incremental ad of these streaming services, it's that specific show, you know, it's the last of us on HBO, that's the must have show that kind of pulled you into that incremental ecosystem. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's uh, typically the same in terms of clients who have, uh, through deliberate choice, or, you know, in some cases, just a lack of governance, pursued more of that best of breed approach in, in pursuing these services. And so what I like about what you said, David, is, you know, the, the objective is not to constrain, constrain choice. And when we think about the meta cloud as this abstraction layer, you know, I think it's important to distinguish between those, uh, th those functions that you're looking to um, standardize or abstract uh, versus the things where you want to remain cloud native. And, and David, I wonder what your view is on that in terms of the strategic choices that you make in terms of what you want to manage collectively uh, versus those pieces where it's still important, you know, to to um, you know to to access that differentiated capability that may have pulled you into cloud in the first place. Yeah, and that's the hard part because you have to take a very pragmatic approach to doing this. Not everything can be abstracted. In other words, we're going to have to deal with a lot of native. Uh, services on the terms of the native service um, because it doesn't either it's a one-time thing we're not using it in the other various cloud therefore it doesn't make sense for it to be abstracted uh, it has no abstraction automation technology that can exist centrally and it just makes sense to punch through the layer instead of dealing with a single super cloud meta cloud whatever you want to call it uh, but deal with the with the uh, with the cloud on its native services, and there's no reason you can't do that. And we've been doing that for you know 20, 30 years. If you think about the larger distributed systems, it was a similar thing. Now the abstraction automation layers are way more primitive back then, and how they do it. But the reality is, in many instances, you couldn't demand that people always leverage this layer and never go to the native. Uh, uh, native interfaces and APIs. There's many cases where that had to happen, and there's lots of exceptions to this rule. And I think the thing is that we're kind of understanding about this meta cloud, super cloud thing is we're building these things and planning these things, that there's lots of exceptions that have to be made and lots of things that are not, not capabilities of the tools and technology where they can't communicate with the, with the native capabilities, where some can. We have security management layers 
that can deal with different identity ma uh, management systems on different cloud providers and do so through a single aggregated layer, which is much better than dealing with each and every security system on its terms. And that's where the complexity comes in. That's where people make mistakes. And that's how the breaches are occurring right now. Um, we're finding that you know, eight times out of 10, when I see a breach that occurs within the cloud, it wasn't the fault of some uh, issue with the cloud. It was fault in some human error that was made because the complexity was too great. In other words, they had to deal with five different security systems on five different platforms. One was misconfigured because they, they transposed one over the other, and that's how it occurred. And if you have sort of some sort of an overreaching system that's able to monitor and manage that system, that's, that's going to be much better for you. However, it doesn't solve all problems. And yeah. the reality is that, that you have to look at the exceptions and how this thing's going to morph over time. Eventually, I think we will have a standard set of platforms that we can leverage, that we can consume. But right now we're knitting these things together. We're making a lot of exceptions and that's the only way we think we're gonna make this work in the next three or four years. You know, Kevin, or oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I, I, was, I was just gonna say, when we think about system architecture, you know, there is uh, obviously this this longstanding trend away from monolithic systems and and some of the dangers that that can present. And and David, when I when I think about your example of security specifically, you know, I, certainly there are a lot of clients that we have that are trying to pursue more of a modern engineering approach, trying to shift left and and bring uh, security. Um, earlier into the development cycle, into the project life cycle. Um, and, and I think um, there are clients that have taken, you know, I'll say uh, a monolithic approach to security in, in terms of um, creating layers that has impacted velocity. And so, I, I you know, I, I raise that because I think um, the trade-offs, like what, 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 David, would you see as the trade-offs or the dangers in, in, you know, making sure that the way in which you pursue these abstraction layers of the meta cloud is is architected uh, correctly. That you know, you may, you're not impacting velocity. You're not impacting uh, the value creation through that process. Yeah, don't compromise architectural disciplines that have been tried and true over the last twenty years. And so, everything should be engineered for security. I was never a fan in people who are bolting security systems on as the last step of the application development process. It should be engineered at every step of the game. And the app dev teams yeah. that I've run always have a security developer, a security architect that exists from the design, the development, the deployment, uh, you know, putting it in the DevOps tool chains, all these things should exist. So th that really doesn't go away. Th this is something that in essence, by the time we get it and deploy it, then it's managed at a different layer. But as far as building systems, uh, building systems in certain ways where they're gonna be monolithic and have to be adhere to some sort of a larger framework, that's never gonna be the case. The, yeah. Whatever the security manager is when the super cloud or meta cloud needs to adapt to whatever security approaches that you're taking within the application, if it can't do that, it can't solve your problem. So the reality is you're never gonna compromise on security. You're gonna build everything with zero trust with the best encryption, the best identity access management, uh, the best data tagging, all these sorts of things by the time you get to deployment, this security system that's centralized does nothing more than, than becomes aware of that, your approach and manage it on your manages it on your behalf and should, as a purpose of why it exists and why we paid a lot of money for it, remove a lot of the risk for us in dealing with the differences with how we're deploying security systems at the application level, at the system level, at the cloud level, at the data level. Uh, with whatever you you pick and choose. That's the only way this works. If you start compromising things where everybody has to yeah. write to a particular meta API or write to a, uh, basically change their application so it can be managed, that's it's not it's not having utility anymore. It loses value. Then we're yeah. making things worse. So so a question this, that I this, have. Oh, go ahead, Dolliver, please. I was gonna say, I was gonna say this is the what we are really introducing here as a concept is the third way, let's call it a third way. The first two, that the first two ways or the ways that I think organizations are traditionally addressing this complexity, both have significant drawbacks. And if I could summarize, David, what I heard you say is organizations that are that have gotten themselves into this multi-cloud complexity, which I think most organizations are going to be landing in that spot at some point. Many have already are already there. First way is to manage that complexity natively, which requires specialized skills, high cost of talent that is scarce, 
uh, which, which is the problem for the option one. High complexity, high cost, high talent, deep skills, scarce skills. But that's the traditional way number one. Way number two is forced homogeneity, as in let's limit the number of cloud, cloud solutions we have, which has significant drawbacks in and of itself, low flexibility, right? Compromise on functionality. But these were the two only, only two options. What you are introducing here is actually the third option, the third way that kind of gets the best of both without the drawbacks of either, right? Extract, sit at the top yeah. and, 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 and deal with key elements of the functionality in that, in that sort of above view, which, which is exceptionally smart, clever. And I'm, I'm really keen to hear from you, David and Kevin, may, maybe some of the examples of who might be doing this well, who might be um, like in other ways, in other emerging good practices here and emerging things of what not to do that people are perhaps discovering through, you know, the, the school of hard knocks. You want to take that, Kevin? Uh, why, why don't you go first, David? I'll fill in. Sure. <clears throat> Most people arrive at their complexity wall, and kind of that's what they're hitting uh, through organic and unplanned development. And so it's almost like shadow IT, you know, back in the 90s and the early 2000s when cloud started to emerge. And that's how SaaS providers grew up is they sold to the divisions and they didn't sell to IT. Yep. So as people are solving problems within their enterprise, that's extending them out to other systems that are becoming more, make it more heter heterogeneous. In other words, I'm dealing with another AI system because I like the one on Google versus the one on this one. And you know, therefore they add the cloud and add the cloud service and things like that. And normally without uh, any understanding about how the complexity, you know, challenge will get in there. In many instances, they hide it from IT and then they put it at the doorstep of IT and say, hey, by the way, I need you to manage this now. And it, it's in full production for the last five years and it's generating half, half a billion dollars <laughs> for the business, um, yeah. which, which is what, you know, IT is complaining about right now. So we get to that point, you know, ultimately, you know, this is about leveraging um, the, the technology in a different way and what the clients are seeing right now when they hit this, hit this uh, complexity wall, they figured out they, they didn't plan this to happen. So you can't really yell at them for not having the plan in place to deal with the complexity because they didn't intend to do a multi-cloud. A multi-cloud kind of happened around them. Like I say, with multi-cloud, either you're going to intentionally do it or it's going to happen to you. It's just a matter of fact in the way IT is going to progress. And then it's a matter of looking at what you have, um, breaking this down into particular domains logically, then rebuilding it up and look for commonalities that you can share across the environments. And that's the planning stage to make it happen. You gotta remember we're fixing a problem in fly, that, that's flying. And by the way, we have a methodology out there called cloud complexity management. I have a three hour course on LinkedIn learning and how to do this. Um, and we're doing so for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're becoming purposeful in how we're building this higher level layer um, before we start buying technology. And so the clients that are succeeding with this are doing the planning to start putting aspects of this in place. They don't have a complete super cloud or meta cloud in place. They may have a common, uh, common management services, which is an AI ops layer, maybe a management monitoring layer, maybe a security manager, things like that, that, that brings them about 60, 70% down to where they need to be. That's where, it, that's where they are right now. So we got a couple of things occurring uh, from the client level. Clients realize when they have a problem, and I think most people out there realize that this is coming or they're feeling the pain right now, normally in the value, not coming back from the business, we could be going into an economic downturn. They're very concerned about that because as soon as you get into an economic downturn, then things that aren't making money or co more costly than they originally anticipated have a tendency to be put at risk. Uh, so they see that. We're not seeing, um, and moving forward, they have the capabilities of building these various systems and doing such a way. And so they're planning to make this happen. That's another thing that's going on. And then we see the experimenters out there, people who are buying tools and throwing tools at the problem. In other words, they buy an AI ops tool without any really understanding how they're going to do it. And they go ahead and put it into a pilot phase and they, they, they build a system around it. So to answer your question, it's very, uh, it's very scattered. <clears throat> how clients are dealing with this. Um, you know, my advice to them, if given to you have to do some planning and create what this logical layer is working from the ground up 
to build into commonalities of things, common knowledge uh, uh, knowledge base in terms of the AI systems and data, even legacy and mainframe stuff, edge, edge based computing, security systems, governance systems, things like that. Understand your requirements, figure out where your native interfaces are and abstract those up into a larger layer of design where we figure out in a logical way what this thing needs to do. In other words, if we could develop the system or define it, what, how does it need to exist? How does it need to function? And then look for uh, technologies out there that you can layer into this thing to make it work. And so that's where we are right now. We're kind of at the talking stage, experimenting stage, throwing tools at the problem stage, uh, scared stage. I think that's where most of them are right now. Um, so it's a bit of a mad dash into making this happen. Yeah. You know, the, the only thing I'd add is uh, from, from a Canadian perspective, I find with our clients, um, cost is typically the canary in the coal mine, right? And, and a lot of our clients, I, I think, um, you know, probably had a stronger bias for action in the wake of COVID. Um, and, and that certainly drove a lot of investments that may have introduced complexity that, you know, I think uh, some of our clients are just getting their arms around now. And, and typically the starting point for that is um, looking at cloud consumption costs and some of the steps that you would take uh, to build in the governance, the tracking and the visibility, um, you know, that's that's typically the starting point that I've seen where, you know, large organizations start to get their uh, start to get the bigger picture as far as what their cloud footprint truly looks like and where there may be uh, redundancies, inefficiencies. Um, and, and certainly in 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 the current operating environment, I, I think that, um, you know, that cost lens is important for driving support for these types of investments. Um, you know, the only other thing that I'll say is when we did our cloud adoption research and, and we surveyed 200 organizations, this is a, a little over a year ago, and the U.S. did a, a comparable study shortly thereafter. And, and so when we compare the data, we can say empirically the Canadian market is behind um, just in terms of when they started. So most Canadian organizations, on average, the response was that they were four to six years into their cloud journey. Um, and just like the, the the proportion of their systems that are in public cloud uh, today, uh, most large Canadian organizations are anywhere from a quarter to a third in public cloud. And, and a lot of that is still software as a, as a service solutions, um, heavy private cloud footprint. And, and yet, you know, not, notwithstanding that, you know, 93% of our survey respondents, um, you know, expressed a, a multi-cloud strategy. And, and so it's it's multi-cloud, it's hybrid cloud, and, and that is the focus. You know, when I hear David talk about planning for this, designing for this, you know, I, I sort of take stock in, um, I think the Canadian market uh, still has a lot of opportunity to build that in um, and start now, even as, uh, you know, there's additional runway ahead of us uh, with future cloud investments to come. Yeah, I think the Canadian market has an opportunity to learn from other people's mistakes, uh, you know, if they are if they are where you are in their progress. And so, you know, that's a better place to be where you're learning from the best practices of other folks. The other thing I'm seeing, and, and, and by the way, I think that uh, they're probably on the same sort of journey right now. I'm not sure if it's, you know, it's so many years behind, but uh, you know, dealing with the same problem. The other problem that we're seeing right now is people actually making things more complex um, because in other words, we have a complexity management issue. Let's start throwing tools and technology at it and they create silos into itself <laughs> or we're spending, uh, you know, spending $10 million on a particular tool and program and skill set training thing to solve a problem that's only costing us 3 million a year. And I see those things every week. Uh, and so you kind of have to look at the pragmatic aspect of it. You're starting to move in this direction. How should you move and how should you justify the spending and making things forward? And I think this is a lot of battles that win the war. This is not one big thing. And I, this is very much like cloud computing. People wanted to move to cloud in a very short period of time. You have to pick out a certain domain and deal with that first and deal with them one at a time. In other words, deal with management monitoring, deal with security, deal with governance, deal with FinOps, all these sorts of things. The idea that we're going to create this meta cloud layer that's going to solve all our issues and then the miracle occurs kind of layer, um, yeah. well, it's not going to happen. And yeah. so it's right. advising people that this is going to be a long trod. It's probably going to take them 10 to 15 years to complete, to get, get to a point where it's 
completely automated, we're able to reduce the amount of spending, we're able to become more effective and efficient, but we should have incremental benefits that occur along the way, or else yeah. it's not going to get funded. That's kind of the way we do things uh, and do things I in love. the companies. So that's what I'm seeing I the really, clients. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, man. No. I, so that's I, what I'm seeing by the clients right now. And I think that uh, it, it's it's going to be a continued pattern. It's going to be a learning curve, just yeah. like anything else. It's going to be a slow boil, uh, not necessarily a, a revolution. It's going to be an evolving thing. Yeah. It's um, your then a miracle occurs line was not lost <laughs> on me. I remember that old comic strip, right? With the scientists, you know, like step one, step two, then a miracle occurs, step three, you know, profit. But um. I think that's right. I, I mean, one of the big themes we've seen over tech trends over the years, and, and I, I spoke to it at the jump, is, is this idea that simplicity is, is a tailwind, right? And, and, you know, there's all these poetic quotes, Da Vinci supposedly said, you know, is the greatest simplicity is the greatest sophistication. I think um, a lot of penny wise decisions have resulted in this pound, pound poor mess. And, um, and it's not the first time we've seen it. Um, I, I remember when ERPs were all over the place and middleware was all the rage. And I mentioned that old, old bellwether vitria, which was one of my first middleware stacks I worked on back in gosh, like 99, 2000. Yeah. That was EAI. There's the book back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and so, um, you know, we have some great questions from our audience and, and folks, for those of you who have have some, you know, um, you know, weapons free, feel free to ask, ask more. I've got a slightly, it might be a little bit of a nerdy one, but I think, I think we're, we're among friends here and I, and I can ask it. And that is how, how does this super cloud, meta cloud, bigly cloud, whatever we want to call it, how does this thing, simplicity as a service north of the clouds compare to all the Kubernetes and containerization approaches that that I know I'd been hearing about for the last three, four, five years. Is this all colors in the same rainbow or is this a change of kind, not just degree? No, it's a great question, Mike. And the reality is that one of the things that's gonna be in a super cloud and meta cloud as you build it is gonna be an application development and deployment platform. Um, the best practice now, and it looks like this is where the, where the trend is moving, where the winds are blowing, it's going to be cloud native systems, which means it's going to be containers, container orchestration, meaning Kubernetes and Docker based containers for a lot of the net new development and even the redevelopment of applications. And one of the opportunities here, we have the ability to create applications that are federated by nature. In other words, we can have them exist within the super cloud, even though they don't, they exist on a particular cloud provider and actually move the containers around as we need to and deploy them on the clouds are going to provide them with the best uh, storage system, the best performance and the lowest cost. Uh, and so in other words, just build it once and be able to run it anywhere we want. Now the portability stuff comes with a bit of a cost and there's some, what I call a container tax. You have to spend some more time and effort to, to build a container that's portable in the system. But moving forward, we can build these applications that are able to be scattered across these various systems that are going to be purposeful for what they're doing. In other words, get to the cloud that provides them with the best AI system because it needs to access to the native system because it's bound to it, it's exist on that cloud. Uh, data analytics on another cloud, and basically span the applications that way. That's kind of tough to do today. And one of the things I always tell people that's probably not a good idea, you can take a look at it. I can build anything with enough money and time, but that's the, but as time moves forward to get into right. federated Kubernetes, which is a standard that's been emerging for a few years, hasn't moved very quickly. And also we deal with the providers out there, um, you know, <clears throat> VMwares and the Red Hats that are providing these capabilities to span clouds. They're fairly cloud agnostic. We have a big opportunity here because wouldn't it be neat? Um, I wrote a paper for IEEE a while ago, uh, which we're talking about self-migrating, you know, intelligent containers. Well, these containers can be launched and they have their own autonomous advantage where they can migrate and push themselves on any cloud provider that they feel should be the hosting of this particular container. So in other words, they have information and they leverage AI systems to move themselves around. Now you do too much of that. You're defeating the purpose. You're making things unnecessarily complex, but also, if you're building a highly scalable system, that's going to cost you a million dollars a year in cloud fees. You're able to reduce it to a half a million dollars a year in cloud fees based on this ability to self-migrate. 
and tune and leverage the right workload on the right cloud provider for the most efficiency, that's a big advantage. And I think we're getting to a point where uh, we're starting to ask the questions that maybe, okay, those things exist. And, and that's a spot on question, Mike, because what's the application development layer going to be here? What's How is it going to change? It is going to change. We're going to deploy ultimately into a centralized system that's above the clouds, and it'll deploy natively on whatever cloud provider using whatever technology they need to deploy on, you know, based on the capabilities of that cloud provider and the efficiency of it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, this, this was very good, David. I mean, exciting times ahead. Uh, another question that came from the audience was um, for those enterprises that are perhaps early in its in their migration to cloud and early in establishing this multi-cloud environment that requires uh, abstraction and, or that will benefit from this kind of abstraction and management, are there any no-brainer capabilities that organizations ought to be looking to, to abstract first? Or yeah, what another... might be some of those? Yeah, please go ahead. Another great question. The, the technology that seems to be furthest along is the operational observability technology. So AI ops, big panda Dynatrace, you know, there's, there's probably 20 companies out there that do this. And so if you're going to start doing management and monitoring, use some sort of a tool that's going to provide you with cross cloud capabilities. So in other words, if you build your monitoring capabilities only on the native tool, of the single cloud that you're using, because that's our primary cloud provider. We're a small business. We haven't, you know, branched off and started using multi-cloud capabilities yet, which is what many small businesses are, and certainly below billion dollars. Believe it, that's a small business. Then let's start thinking about the future and making sure that the solutions that we pick that we're binding to, and they're going to be very difficult to decouple in the future, provide these cross-cloud capabilities to take us to other cloud providers. So in essence, it's kind of the seed of what a super cloud is. And then we start adding other services like security and uh, governance and FinOps, you know, as we become more sophisticated and we're able to spend more money. I think that's the no brainer. That makes tons of sense. Kev, what have you seen, man? Well, I, I, I was gonna maybe just take us into a little bit of a different direction here. I, I feel like we'd be remiss if um, in, in talking multi-cloud, we, we didn't talk a little bit about just the the connection to how organizations want to manage the relationship with the big cloud providers and with their hyperscalers, um, and and we you know we in uh, in in our Canadian clients that have seen a, a full range of of postures uh, from organizations that are a bit more uh, disciplined in terms of a primary cloud provider and some of the advantages that that might have uh, in, in many cases securing investment um, from the cloud provider. Uh, for you know, for for greater consumption targets, um, to other organizations that are more actively leveraging you know some of the architectural techniques that we've talked about here, whether it be the meta cloud Kubernetes, uh, to allow for more portability. You know, I think um, for some of the more heavily regulated uh, sectors, there's there's kind of increased interest in this idea of an exit strategy. You know, how 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 would it work if you need to exit workloads off of a particular cloud provider? And, and I guess, David, you know, maybe you can help us think about this in that context. What, what do you view as the connection between what we're talking about as the meta, the meta cloud and the strategy organizations want to take in terms of how they're going to balance, um, you know, the balance of power that they have in their relationships with multiple cloud providers? Great question. And, you know, these things really kind of come or should come with a systemic FinOps layer. So we're able to monitor what's spending where. If you get into these multi-cloud billing things, they're hugely complex and how all these things move, move between these various systems. So if we're managing the billing, we're able to manage the relationship and the terms around the billing. So we're able to go back to the cloud providers, each of them, with a very detailed view of how we're leveraging their system and also provide them with views in terms of what the alternatives are. You're charging, you know, two cents per gigabyte for storage. And these folks are charging one, you know, one cent. We're going to see a lot of these things moving forward as some of these smaller niche player clouds start to arrive. And totally. you can use that as a bargaining position or just go ahead and make the move. And to the point I made earlier, if we're able to build application workloads, they're able to move fairly easily and in between cloud providers, you know, lift and shift or even, uh, sophisticated container-based portability, you know, then we have options to make this happen. And I think we're moving to a point 
where these things are going to be self-migrating. You know, very much like a data center where you use different power supply pliers th these days to get the redundancy that's there, but also to get the cost differences. This is power supply rate, uh, power generator raises their uh, bill uh, up to a certain rate. We're going to leverage somebody else's provider because it's just power. It's commodity. Well, storage pretty much is storage on other cloud providers. Databases are very much databases on other cloud providers. And in fact, in many cases, they're offering the same brands of stuff. I mean, getting back to Mike's analogy, in terms of the streaming services, I mean, how many streaming services can you watch The Office on? You know, pretty much all of them. And so you're going to end up paying for this for the cheapest streaming service that's able to going to provide that. As you start commoditizing, some of these things are going to monetize, some of these things aren't. Then your ability to deal with these systems as commodities is something that's switchable, it's something that you can manage on your terms is going to be part of the benefit of doing this. And but so I'll tell you. that's going to be an offshoot. Yeah, but I'll... <clears throat> you know, analogies giveth and taketh away. <laughs> it says a guy who over overuses them. But um, I remember 15 years ago when the cable companies started to see that, oh my goodness, um, we're at risk of becoming perceived as an undifferentiated commoditized pipe. And it's hard to sell high margin work when you're just a pipe. And so a lot of those companies worked really hard to make sure they were no longer just distributors. They were content producers too, right? Um, the whole Comcast NBC merger comes to mind, um, which is all to say, I, I wonder, Kevin, if um, back to your last of us on HBO example, I, I wonder if we'll start to see cloud providers offering like can't miss features or, or hyper proprietary capabilities that allow them to retain hmm. differentiation in a world of the market kind of forcing commoditization, you know? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think we are seeing that, you know, I, I think uh, uh, all of our, all of our cloud alliance partners would, would sort of say that they, they feel that commoditization effect for, you know, probably more of their core IaaS services. And, and certainly, you know, we, we have seen tremendous investment and innovation in the platform and application level services uh, that they can offer within their ecosystems. Um, I, I think we're seeing it very prominently in just the last year with uh, generative AI. And there is yeah. certainly an arms race underway across the big cloud providers uh, in, in AI and and all of the, the the use cases downstream from that that we anticipate we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, I think uh, our colleagues in in our US team, uh, I think put out a piece last year around the trend towards industry cloud, this idea that there is a, a trend towards increasingly sophisticated and sector specific, solutions and capability that you can access through the cloud. I, I think we're going to continue to see that more often than not uh, paired with AI into the future. And so, I, you know, again, that's kind of coming full circle to where, you know, where we started earlier in this conversation. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, what, what, what I see us trying to do with this is, is sound the alarm around the potential risks of cost and complexity. Um, because, you know, certainly as David said, for organizations that have been at this for a while, they are hitting the wall. And, and, you know, I think nobody wants that to detract from the core value proposition and potential that cloud has. Yeah. Um, but that's not to suggest that, you know, we're abstracting away from some of the really cool services and innovation that you can access through the cloud, right? And so that that is that balance in terms of how you architect for this, how you think strategically and design and plan uh, yeah. for this as a part of your, you know, as part of your your cloud strategy, as a part of your investments moving forward in this space. You know, yeah. have, uh, one thing to remember too is this this is a forced march to the cloud. Uh, in other words, uh, it's really kind of the only game in town if you're looking for innovative solutions. So the R&D spend that's going on in the industry right now, 80% of it, 85%, when I just looked at a few years ago, I'm sure it's worth now, is, is occurring on cloud-based platforms. And if you're looking at the investments that the big providers are doing, they're just investing in cloud. So we're moving in this direction, um, you know, whether you like it or not, but mainly we're moving in this direction because that's where the innovation is occurring. Right. And most of that innovation is going to be proprietary to your point, Mike. I, I remember a couple of years back, uh, one of the first pieces I had the opportunity to contribute to here when I joined Deloitte 
four years ago was a, an exploration of what was cooking in open source land. And, and we, we were looking at this idea um, that, to your point, Dave, um, that w one of the big reasons open source was starting to come back into, the, in, in, into focus for enterprise buyers was that's where all the cool stuff was. Like you, 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 you want to use, you know, you know, but before it was generative AI and it was merely AI, right. You know, you, you want to use this, you want to use that Well, cool, find it in GitHub and it's a library and grab it. And it, it, and the thought experiment, right. So the flip side was just like, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I got to go where the cool kids are and the cool kids are all up there in, in, in the shared cloud-based repositories. Yeah. And that's where the investments are being made. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Dalibor, some cool questions from our audience. Steve's there are, questions there cool. are. There Do you are want to maybe read, read, read one or two of those? So, so, so the, I'm also aware that we are about four minutes before the end. And I do want to ask an important question, practical question. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is like, this is nascent now. We believe this would be a major solution to this real problem. David yeah. and Kevin, what would be your advice for organizations looking to start exploring this multi-cloud layer, abstraction layer? What would, where would, you, what would you advise them to do first, second, third? Kevin, you can go first. Um, I, I mean, if if I kind of come back and hit some of the themes that we've touched on, right? I, I think uh, starting practically uh, with putting the observability tools in place. Um, so that you can get uh, a handle on on activity across your organization and across platforms. Uh, I, I think naturally coming out of that, the financial view and, and understanding consumption, and I see a, a question around uh, the pricing, right? And that, that yeah. can get uh, complex, but starting to get your arms around that, just given um, the financial dimension is, is such a driver um, to any investments that you're going to make uh, within this space. Pairing that uh, with, um, with, with the right governance uh, to drive a, a level of, of ownership, um, particularly for large organizations that have multiple divisions, you know, to me, these are the foundations for a strong multi-cloud uh, program. You know, and, and then, you know, as, as David articulated, for a lot of those core functions, you know, and, and whether it's, it's starting with, uh, you know, with security or with IAM, for a lot of these core operational and security functions, starting, you know, picking one to start and thinking about what that looks like holistically across your cloud platform. But I think the starting point for a lot of organizations, and again, if I come back to the data, a lot of us within the Canadian market are still very much in the early stages. It starts with getting your arms around what that footprint looks like how that translates organizationally and starting to insert some discipline and governance in place. And that doesn't necessarily mean constraining choices, uh, but it does, make, it, does, it does mean making conscious choices um, as, as opposed to you know, shadow IT or some of the other dangers that we've talked about on, in, this, in this conversation. Yeah, that was almost the perfect response uh, Response to that. The only thing I would add is learn all you can. Uh, attending this webinar is a great, great place to start. Follow us at Deloitte. We're going to become uh, putting out a lot of thought leadership uh, areas. In other words, we're first movers in the space and going to continue to be first movers in the space. And then just get the planning in place. You know, start thinking about this and how you're going to make it done and what skill sets are going to be there. And then to Kevin's point, you know, get some technologies in play. Observability yeah. would be the lowest hanging fruit and get it going. Observability. And as I heard, of course, as we know, there are uh, software providers who actually are out there with suite of tools that can be can be used to, to anything that's that. anything that's cross cloud uh, yeah. that's uh, cloud agnostic or are tools you want to that are viable applications in this space. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you all. This was very very interesting, very very interesting. Um, I love that that we sense this. This is truly truly I think a trend that is going to be very very real for most organizations. Fast forward a couple of years from now, so this was excellent. For our audience members, just a reminder, next week, same channel, same time, same place, we are going to be unpacking the, the very important topic of women in technology and how to do DEI D -E -I right. And in order, in order to do that, we have invited a great panel of speakers, Shannon Bell, 
who is a senior vice president of IT at Rogers Communications, Samantha Rahim, who is a CIO of Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Jody McDermott, uh, a partner at Deloitte, and Hilary McVeigh, who is actually at Deloitte Consulting's DEI leader, are going to be joining me to talk about this important topic about you know, women in technology in general and then how to do DEI right. And then two weeks from now, Mike Bechtel and me are going to go into the next deep dive of tech trend number four, which is going to be on flexibility, the best ability. We're going to be doing a deeper dive into the future of tech talent and how our leading organization, our organizations also finding the third way, the third way to resolve their tech talent challenges. So please join us for that. And with that, the panel, thank you all very much. Thank you. You were fantastic. We will share the recording and have yourselves a lovely Wednesday afternoon. See you soon. See you all. Cheers, Thanks. guys. Thanks, everybody.